own representative Charles Van Zandt. Come on up. Uh, representative Van Zandt is going to introduce our keynote speaker. But we want to thank you, representative, for your faithful service to our state. I ran against all odds. 
and uh, against my own party who didn't want me to run, not on that issue. I've been a Republican for about 38 years, but that wasn't on the agenda. And uh, so I had to take out two Republican opponents in the primary and stayed in the running uh, gunfight with the party all the way through the primary. But once I won, then I got an artillery war with the Democrats. And that's how I won. And God has preserved me ever since in this place. tell you that the political arena is a tough place to take a stand with this issue. Some of you already know that. In a minute we're going to hear from Dan Becker who knows that huge big time. My first bill, you know, I got there with my aide on the 11th floor of the Capitol, it was a nice office, and so I called my aide in, I said, Mary Jo, do you know how to write a bill? She was my legislative aide. She said, no, sir, I don't know anything about writing a bill. I said, well, I don't either. I said, but I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll pull up uh, Daniel Webster, Senator Webster's uh, ultrasound bill that failed in the Senate the year before, and we'll just file that. Me, would you print it out and let me read it over, and if I need to make any changes, I can. Like, you know, which year it is or something. And uh, so I didn't know anything about writing a bill. So we filed that. That was the first bill. It took us about two and a half years to get that issue passed. That's an incremental step, of course, to just try to limit abortion by making the abortion, quote, doctor, do something he's not accustomed to. I didn't have any idea the many facets that were involved in fighting abortion. I never thought about post-abortive counseling. I never knew how many abortion clinics were in Florida or any other state for that matter. I didn't understand about the fact that the father of an aborted child might be grieving and actually wanted the child the mother of aborted it anyway. I didn't understand all of the different things you run into. And so I'm very grateful for all of you because God called me to fight abortion politically. There's no way to fight abortion just politically. So the second year I was there, I wrote the Florida for Life Act and filed it ever since every session. But I haven't gotten a hearing not one committee in the House of Representatives. Not one in the Senate. In fact, the first two years, there was no senator who would even file it for me. Now I've got some friends in the Senate that will file it as a courtesy. But they just do that as a courtesy. There's no way it's going to get heard. With the present environment that we have in our House and Senate, I will tell you that twice Governor Scott has told me he will sign the bill into law, and that will terminate abortions in the state of Florida if it stands the Supreme Court test. My strategy is to test the law. Most people say, well, if we get it before the Supreme Court, we'll lose. My feeling is if we just get the fight in the air, the unborn children will win. And so I want to get the fight in the air, so while you're praying, please pray that we'll get a hearing on this bill. That's my story. That's why I'm in politics. That's why I'm your state representative. That's why I'm here today. There's no other reason for me to be in politics, really. There's a lot of other people that are far more intelligent than I am that can handle all of the issues that confront our state and confront our nation. I'm just there because God told me to fight abortion politically. That's a very narrowly defined place to be. So I would ask you to pray for me. Now secondly, we came across this book called Personhood. It was written by a guy named Daniel Becker. Well, we never heard of Daniel Becker, but the Personhood book is profound. 
And then I, was, I received a phone call, I think from Jay, a couple of years ago. And so I drove down here to Orlando and had dinner with some personal good folks and found out more about this and more about who Dan Becker was. This man is a friend of humanity. Beginning with the unborn. And you know the whole ruse of the devil is to destroy the unborn from the beginning. This didn't start with Moses. This didn't start with Herod and Jesus. This started with Cain and Abel. It is that Satan's mantra, his goal, his impetus for being is to kill, to steal, to destroy. Jesus told us that, but beyond that, more focused, it is to take one part of humanity and destroy another. So we think of war, we think of all of man's inhumanity to man. But when you think about abortion, you have to think about mankind's inhumanity to the most innocent of all creation. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to welcome Daniel Becker, who understands this more than anybody in this group. Now, where were we in the year 2000? We had no 
enforceable pro-life law in the state of Georgia, and we have been an organization for 28 years. 28 years and not a single enforceable law in the state of Georgia. 3% of our legislature were pro-life by the definition of being pro-life that the movement founded back in the 70s. That does not, by the way, include a rape and incest exception for a uh, quote pro-life politician. We reverted back to a biblical standard. You shall not put a child to death for the crimes of its father, Deuteronomy 24, 16. And that change, that one change, 3% of the legislature in the year 2000, by God's grace, through His power, to His glory, today, 68% of the Georgia Senate, 41% of the House, and all nine statewide elected officials are not only pro-life without exception, but they're a pro-personhood amendment to the Georgia Constitution. Wow. We're the only state in the nation that can make that claim by God's grace, but through His power, standing faithfully. We didn't do it by our organization, our skill, our money, our influence. We did it because God went before us. And that is our testimony in the state of Georgia. Right now, we're only one of two states in the nation that have no rape and incest exceptions in any of the code of laws that are protected. And we were privileged to receive recognition by Americans United for Life just this year as one, number two, all-star state in the nation for the pro-life laws that have been passed in the state we have been among the top 10 most protected states in the nation in the last number of years. Now, last in the nation 13 years later, among the top. In fact, there was a newspaper article. Look at the, look at the date on that. Anybody see the date in the upper left corner? That's today's front page of the Atlanta Journal Constitution. <laughs> I went into the governor two days ago, and this was number two on my list of asking him to intervene, which he did do. And we are now all state employees. There is no taxpayer funding of abortion in the state of Georgia. <laughs> this is what drives me. This is what incenses me. 23 of my 26 grandchildren. This is the next generation. And it's not a fear, it's a certain knowledge of what they will face in their lifetime. The changes in the culture that are occurring at a rapid pace, so rapid that it's difficult to keep up with. I'm going to be sharing three front page news articles that are current, just to give you a context of the change that is going on in the 21st century. The Pillars of Personhood is a seminar that we do here in Georgia. I'm Georgia, it started in Georgia, uh, here in Florida, uh, through Personhood USA. See uh, Brenda McMiniman afterwards. The concept is this, it's very simple. The respect for the sanctity of life and human dignity is being upheld on a biblical foundation of the Imago Dei that God has created man in his image. That has been the foundation of the sanctity of life and human dignity for 2,000 years. <coughs> now, if that foundation erodes, then of course the structure collapse, collapses. But those pillars that you see are also holding up that concept in the culture of the sanctity of life. <coughs> Do you know your church history? Do you know that this has been the position of the church for all 2,000 years? In every century, God has raised up a voice to speak out against the evil of infanticide and the evil of abortion. Western history, do we know our Western history? We're gonna go into that a little bit tonight. The pro-life history, uh, what, how have we gotten here? What have we done in 40 years? 
there is a progression of history that we have. And of course the issues of being anti-abortion, transhumanism and eugenics, those are terms that are just new terms to many of you. If the pillars fall or the foundation erodes, then so goes our culture. And I believe that God and His Word will not return void. And even if this comes about, there out of the ashes will spring a new culture, a new understanding. The gospel of Jesus Christ will go forth with power. Personhood USA is a Christ-centric, gospel-oriented, biblical worldview, faith-based ministry. And it is not always the case among pro-life groups, unfortunately. We decided to consult God's Word, implement His ways, and allow, and, and just faithfully proclaim the truth as a standard for all men and women to respond to. And He did the rest. Miracle after miracle. I can, uh, the, the book that you can buy in the back is just merely a testimony of God's power and grace of His people acting faithfully. I'm going to take you on a little journey back into history. Now, no, that is not the bodies of concentration camp victims being burned in the crematorium. This is Hadamar, Germany, Hadamar, 11 years before Hitler came to power, if you know your history. This is Germany immediately after World War I. They had lost, and as the cost of losing, the Allies had been put an onerous amount of reparation uh, that sent the economy into a tailspin, into a depression. You've seen the pictures of post-World War I Germany, where they had to go to the grocery store with a wheelbarrow for, full of currency, or they would heat their homes with the five billion mark notes that were cir in circulation at the time. Hyperinflation. The financial situation in 1920 was critical. In this <coughs> building that you see the smoke coming out of is the hospital that cares for the German war heroes. Those young men who gave their lives were injured and were recuperating after World War I. And the problem in a hyperinflationary scenario was that obviously and with a social medical system, Cuts have to be made. Rationing has to occur. And so the discussion at a policy level in Germany in 1920, Hitler is in jail right now, writing Mein Kampf. Okay? It's 11 years before he will assume the reins of power of the National Socialist Party. The question that was being debated is where can we cut costs? How do we cut costs to give our wounded heroes, the care that they need, and they decided that it would be at the cost and sacrifice of useless eaters. Useless eaters. Who are these useless eaters? They justified and argued that economic saving justified the killing of useless eaters. Ever heard of a slippery slope argument? Slippery slope is when you take a hard case, and Representative Van Zant knows the common legislative uh, precept that hard cases make bad law. Hard cases make bad law. When you take the worst of what is existing and then write a law about it for the purpose of achieving an objective in the future, through the expansion of that law. What they did was, they passed a law that said that children born with Potter syndrome, which is a condition, malformation of the kidneys, no amniotic fluid, uh, up until just two weeks ago, it was virtually terminal. To ever, it was an absolute di diagnosis of death. We have a congresswoman in the state of Washington who refused to kill her child diagnosed with this condition, who is alive and well today. 
as a result of remarkable treatments that have been developed to cure this particular condition. But in 1920, it was deadly. And assembly, where there is only a lower brain stem, no higher brain function in the child. Usually not a very good prognosis. Trisomy 16, 18, and 21, chromosomal anomalies. They didn't know what that, it wasn't called that in 1921, but that included Down syndrome, which they said was a condition that was incompatible with life. Well, the problem with establishing law around heart cases is that they eventually expand to include others. The incurably ill or medically futile were next on the list. Then it became the mentally challenged. They cleared out, cleaned out their, quote, mental institutions of useless eaters. Then it became the blind, deaf, and dumb children of all ages. Children of all ages with some form of disability. And of course, 20 years later, it was half-breeds and other undesirables, and then eventually the Holocaust itself, which you know. The slippery slope of beginning with those hard cases and moving down. They would have a school bus with the windows boarded up that would pull up to the homes of these eight and nine-year-old children that were blind, deaf, or dumb. They were insulated against the screens as they were removed from their families under the promise of the best medical care that the German medical scientists could provide, medical establishment could provide. Unfortunately, within a few months, the family would re receive an urn of ashes with an accompanying death certificate of some that the child had succumbed to a childhood disease such as syphilis or gonorrhea, or that they had succumbed to acute appendicitis even though they had their appendix out for years before. Up to a hundred victims a day were arriving at Hadamer in these school buses. And they were told to disrobe, they were told that they were going for a medical examination, and they were tagged with different colored band-aids. First color of band-aid was the category to kill. Just kill them. Inject some form of deadly serum. The second was kill and remove their brain for, for, for study, scientific research. And the third category for the older mental patients and so forth was to kill them and remove their gold teeth. 100 victims a day by 1941. Of course, the problem was the public was not fooled. Parents began a movement, an outcry. And of course, 1921, 21 years after the inception of the program, Hitler was in power. Goebel and the propaganda machine running at its full strength. And even with all of that tyranny represented by Adolf Hitler and the Nazi regime, the people, the parents of Germany, through their public outcry, were able to stop the T4 Actium program in its tracks. It takes outrage from within the culture, the community, crying out against the evil, and even Hitler had to bow to that. Now they were using these children as scientific research subjects. And what do you, where do you get? I mean, German science led the world. Where do you go to get human research subjects after 1941? Well, they turned to the concentration camps. They, uh, they took the inmates, they dressed them in the same garb that a German pilot would wear if he were downed in the North Sea. You know, the North Sea is just a degree or two above freezing. You can see the ice cubes in the bottom right-hand corner of the bathtub there. As they submerge the downed pilot, the inmate, into this freezing 
saltwater brine until hypothermia set in. And then they would remove its brains and test them scientifically while they were alive. Anesthesia was reserved for those on the Western Front. Now, I won't to go into too, too many grisly details, but the history of Germany wouldn't be complete without the atrocity of Joseph Mengele. Mengele specialized in identical twins, children, experimenting on children. You know how our modern medical technology has uh, achieved near 100% success in saving some conjoined twins, separating Siamese twins. He did just the reverse. He took two born identical twins and surgically conjoined them to see what the physiological and emotional effect would be. Heinous actions. This is 1945 during the Nuremberg trials after the war. Thomas Dodd showed the jury the epitome of a neo-pagan science. A shrunken human head was the epitome of their medical achievement and accomplishment. Depravity, how does the culture get there? The land of reform, reformation, taken over and in a number of years, this is what we see as the outcome. Well, those doctors, 21 of them, were tried for crimes against humanity, for human experimentation without informed consent. Okay, you cannot experiment on an, a human at all unless you have their informed consent. Sixteen of the doctors were found guilty, seven were executed by hanging, and several of the nurses from Hadamir were included in the bunch that served life in prison after World War II. How many of you have blocks? Anybody have a blog? Blogosphere, new term that's out there. Michael Godwin uh, coined this term and it became known as Godwin's Law. It is that as long as the discussion between two parties in a blog is going back and forth, the longer it goes, the more likely one party is going to accuse the other party of being Nazis or being Adolf Hitler. That's, that, that's become a maxim. It's now called Godwin's Law. And it's an automatic mark of concession. You're conceding the argument if you call somebody a Nazi. Okay? Well, Wikipedia, the source of all wisdom and knowledge, uh, says there's only one problem with Godwin's Law. It's when it's actually appropriate. I'm going to let you be the judge. I'm going to run some current events by you, and you tell me where you think we are and whether it's appropriate. This is a front cover of Discover Magazine, May 2012, a year ago. And it was very appropriate. Uh, we were having hearings at the time in our Georgia legislature. The organ harvest proceeded over the objections of the anesthesiologist who saw the brain-dead donor react to the scalpel. Now, you know they call these cadaveric donations. But you, that cadaver can still be breathing still has a beating heart because you can't donate a heart unless it's beating. It has to be cut out of a, a living body. That is a, a requirement for heart transplant. Now we had these hearings where this front cover came out and it was on a private portable medical order that goes on your refrigerator. We were arguing against it because all it was was the beginning of a play for increasing the amount of organ donors that are available through cadaveric donation. And the doctors were defending what we were telling the legislature and saying that what we were saying is not true. And finally, one representative who was sitting on the committee, a House member, African-American brother, looked at the doctor and said, you would have killed me. Two years ago, I had an accident and I was comatose for 10 days. 
And the doctors came to my wife and said, he's dead, donate his organs, and let's call it quits. And he said, if it hadn't been for my God-fearing wife, I wouldn't be with you today. And he said, we're not going to pass this bill. We're not going to do it. And I don't normally tell this story, but because I'm in Florida, a Florida couple and their family that was on vacation coming back to Florida through Atlanta were sideswiped, and the family was sustained cuts and bruises. But the husband who was driving had severe head trauma. He was carried to the nearby hospital where for three days he was in a coma. The fourth day, the doctors came to the wife and said, we're going to unplug him. He's, he, he's not with us anymore. And she said, not so quick. She got the medical records and the data, sent them back here to Florida to her doctor in Jacksonville, who said, I don't agree. We don't agree with the, doc with the prognosis or you know, uh, what has been said. Send him back here and we will care for him. Hospital in Atlanta said, no, no, no. Laws don't permit it here in Georgia. They said, what? We don't have a three-day right of transfer. This man is under our care. We say he's dead. We're pulling the plug tomorrow. She went to the state court, got an injunction, and then the next day it went up to the state Supreme Court. In two days, we had a state Supreme Court case deciding whether or not this man was a person. And the court said, no, he's not. He is a post person. Pull the plug. Personhood. It's a legal construct. It's a concept whereby government recognizes that certain rights and privileges attach. But they can be detached as well, as was the case here. Here's the Georgia Capitol. We had a 20-week fetal pain ban in Georgia. We were supporting the bill because we believe in principled incrementalism. It had no rape and incest exceptions. It had nothing negative that identified a class of human life that you could kill or put to death. And then we learned that a group of senators in the last four hours of the session four hours before the close of the legislative year, hijacked the bill and attached language to the bill that said this. Here's the, uh, the copy, and it was coming from the Georgia Medical Association that a futile pregnancy, medically futile pregnancy, is defined as a fetus who is anencephalic or a diagnosis of Potter's syndrome. I looked up the words and up popped the public policy of Germany in the 1920s. Unbelievable. What an education it was for us a year ago. This is the face of medically futile pregnancy. I had a couple in my church who specialized in hospice care for anencephalic children, who cared for them from the moment of their birth through the hours and days and months that God gave them life here on earth. They were precious, precious children. And I held them in my arms when they celebrated their first birthday and their second and their third. We are not God. We cannot make these kind of decisions and we don't want to be a culture. All cultures are judged by how they treat the weakest member in that culture. These are called now post-birth abortions, infanticide. The killing of children is now coming to America. We have turned a corner in the pro-life movement, in the pro-death culture. This is from just a couple weeks ago. You may have seen Melissa Perry on MSNBC. When she asked the question, when does life begin, I submit the answer depends an awful lot on the feelings of the parents. Powerful feeling, but not science. What was she doing? She was simply articulating the policy 
of President Obama's appointed member to his Obamacare practice, Peter Singer. How many of you have heard of Peter Singer before? If the parents want the newborn, it's wrong to kill the baby because that deprives, the act deprives them of happiness. On the other hand, killing a defective newborn up to 20 days, eight days after birth is not morally equivalent to killing a person. He is one of 15, on a committee of 15, overseeing Obamacare. If you're a senior or approaching your senior years like many of the baby boomers are, that troubles me. Because in Germany, the elderly in the socialized medical structure had a duty to die. A duty to die. To not take up resources in a utilitarian culture. So what, Mary Elizabeth Williams said in January of this year, so what if abortion ends a life? It, the fetus is indeed a life, a life worth sacrificing. Here's the complicated reality in which we all live. All life is not equal. That's a difficult thing for liberals like me to talk about, yet a fetus can be a human life without having the same rights as the woman in whose body it resides. We have turned a corner in the culture of death. Before, it was my body, my right, blob of tissue. Now it's a baby and we can kill it because all human life is not equal. Ideas have consequences. Think what the implications of that policy, once it's enacted as part of our, our, our culture, becomes what kind of fruit will it bear? What do they all have in common? They believe that all human life is not equal. Do you see what happens in a culture when those ideas prevail. The mission of Personhood USA is to get government to recognize the inalienable God-given right to life at all stages of development, to protect human dignity and the sanctity of life. Now, you know, in this whole presentation, we haven't talked about abortion very much. And I'm gonna say something that's almost radical for this group. It's not just about saving babies. That's not what the doctrine of Imago Dei implies. Yes, they're the most vulnerable. And yes, Satan hates the seed of God and man created in that image. And that will always represent child sacrifice <coughs> and killing and, and atrocity. But it's not just about saving the babies. It's about establishing a sanctity of life ethic in our, in our culture again. It's about taking all of the facets of the emerging technologies and everything that is coming upon us in the 21st century. We call that the doctrine of Imago Dei, the personhood principle. And we're gonna explore that just a little bit in the legal ruling in 1973. Everybody's aware that Justice Blackman ruling for abortion on demand uh, stated his case when he wrote that the suggestion of personhood of the preborn is established, the abortion rights case of course collapses for the fetus's right to life is then guaranteed specifically by the 14th Amendment. The whole thing is over the legal understanding and status of personhood, in this case, of the preborn. Now, it began in Roman law. The word persona comes from the, the Latin, and slaves were not persons in, in Roman law. You could do, they were things. You could do with them whatever you wanted because government defined what a person was and what a person wasn't, who was and who wasn't a person. But you know, God's word states an absolute that all mankind, James, book of James, all mankind is created in his image. Saved, unsaved, black, white race is not, a, not an issue. 
But historically, government has attempted to define what personhood is. That's not our goal here. Our goal is to demand that government recognize the inalienable right to life that God has granted. Which, that's what it says in our Declaration of Independence. And that's what we're after, is government recognition, because they don't get it right. Back in 1787, our own constitutional convention, our uh, constitution said that blacks are only three-fifths of all other persons. Now, I know that was for reasons of capitulating to the southern states uh, in their number of congressmen that they had and how that, the, that would be uh, calculated. But they introduced a concept. That concept is there is a class of human life that doesn't have the full protection under our laws that all other persons have. And of course that was uh, clearly shown in the Dred Scott decision 80 years later because ideas have consequences. And they were declared a subordinate and inferior class of beings. 17, or eight, 1857. One year later, the Virginia Supreme Court said, in the eyes of the law, so far certainly as civil rights and relations are concerned, the slave is not a person, but a thing. Now when you see that caution sign, there's going to be a graphic image following. And I'll leave it up a few seconds and then take it down and move on. But if you don't wish to see the consequences of believing that some are things and not persons. And this was long after the Civil War and emancipation. Long after. This is in the South where the prevailing culture still believed. 1876. Women are persons in matters of pains and penalties, but are not persons in matters of rights and privileges. How do you like that, ladies? We can get you on the pains and penalties part, but not the rights and privileges. Well, you know, that didn't sit well with Emily Murphy in 1916. She became the first woman elected in the British Parliament in Canada. And when she went to be seated, the Prime Minister said to her, Emily, I can't seat you. And she said, why? You're not a person. She said, well, we'll see about that. She went to the Canadian Supreme Court. She said to them, are we persons? Does it include female persons? The court's response, absolutely not. You are not persons. What happened next? Anybody know what happened next? A movement public outcry, public opinion, and within a, just a short number of years, women had all the rights and privileges that their male counterparts had enjoyed up until that point. But you know, ideas do have consequences, and if women are not considered equal persons under the law and in the eyes of God, then bad things happen. Economist Magazine, 100 million baby girls no longer with us because of targeted abortion based on gender. Native Americans, 1881, an Indian is not a person within the meaning of the Constitution. Congress may prevent an Indian from leaving his reservation. While he's on the reservation, it may deprive him of his liberty, his property, his life. <laughs> Not a person. You do whatever you want. And that's exactly what happened nine years later after that was written. A peaceful Indian tribe immediately following the massacre at Wounded Knee, I mean at the Little Bighorn, George Custer. Fearing reparations from the settlers and the rogue cavalry that was in the area, asked the U.S. cavalry to escort them to a safe haven. 90 miles away to join another peaceful Indian tribe. And in the process of escorting them, the troops surrounded them and massacred them. They chased the women and the children with babes in their arms as far as two miles from the original scene of the encounter and cut them down without mercy. That was the inquest. 
that military inquest and follow up. November 1935, the Nuremberg Code, of course you know the story of the Jews. Not only were they denied citizenship, which is a form of personhood and protection under the law, but they weren't even called human at some point. They were subhuman. Why is it always the women and the children that suffer? The disturbing pattern of this Imputing someone's humanity to weaken his claims to rights of personhood repeats itself again and again in Western history. Personhood is a legal construct. It's something that government either defines or it recognizes. And it never gets it right the first time. I'm going to introduce you to somebody here. This is... Uh, I'm, I'm going to say this is a little girl. I've got a 50-50 chance of being right. This is Rachel, and she's in her first hours of life. This is at the Zygo stage. Rachel is a perfectly healthy child whose parents no longer wanted her. She was conceived through in vitro fertilization. Do you know that there are over 500,000 children in cryopreservation today? in our clinics. Do you know how long they can exist in that state and still be revived? Scientists believe as long as 200 years. There was a young baby born two years ago who had been prior preserved, has the record right now, 20 years, was born as their twin sibling was graduating from college. Think about that. We live in a in a, a new century, a new age, where there's phenomenal things happening. Well, Rachel, being healthy, but not being protected, you can do anything you want to her. And scientists at Cornell University took Rachel from the Petri dish and injected a gene, a fluorescent gene, from an Australian jellyfish into her newly developing body to see if successive generations of cellular, um, uh, you know, would, would carry that gene. And sure enough, in May 2008, they succeeded in producing the world's first glow-in-the-dark human. 2008. Rachel grew as a healthy child for 14 days before they executed her under the Bush Doctrine. That doctrine has been revoked and they can carry this on much further now if they want to. Now we objected in the Right to Life movement to this heinous act of medical experimentation, what? Without informed consent. Rachel didn't give her consent to be experimented on with deadly experiments. So when we went to the National Institute of Health and objected to Cornell's work, here's what they said. It would not be classified as gene therapy and need a federal review because a test tube embryo is not considered a person. We get in the message here. What's the commonality that we're seeing? It's all centered around personhood. Thomas Glesner, how many of you, uh, any of the ministries here are associated with NIFLA? NIFLA is the uh, legal firm that protects crisis pregnancy centers, pregnancy resource centers. Uh, he wrote a book called The Emerging Brave New World. And we do, we, we're living in a new age. You know, in the 19th century, it was the industrial age. In the 20th century, it was the atomic age. In the 21st century, it is the biotech age. Biotech is doubling from the beginning of, of the very origins of science until today. All of that knowledge will double, they say, in the next 10 years. And then it will double again the following decade. That's how fast things are developing in the scientific community in the area of the emerging technologies. 
we had a gentleman from Chuck Colson's ministry come down and speak to our National Right to Life Convention in 2005. He said there's going to be two terms that come dominate public policy in the 21st century. And we had really heard of either of them. You tell me, transhumanism? Is that on anybody's radar? And eugenics. Dominate public policy in America in the 21st century. These two terms, probably more towards the mid to late latter end of the century, but it's happening now that we're engaging in these two, these two public policy debates. What is transhumanism? It's nothing more than taking the emerging technologies and applying them to the human race in such a way as to create a post-human species known as Homo perfectus under the symbol H+. And if you've got your smartphones, go ahead and type in H+, into Google. You will see Transhumanist Magazine pop up as the number one policy arm of this movement. It's nothing more than man creating man in man's image. And that is blasphemy. It's using the emerging technologies of artificial intelligence. Anything wrong with our artificial computers, iPads, smartphones? No, nothing wrong with artificial intelligence. There's nothing wrong with nanotechnology. Cyborgology, we're okay with heart you know, pacemakers and other mechanical devices that we uh, attach now to extend our health. There's nothing wrong with that. The problem is that it's being led, when it's being led, by the philosophy of transhumanism. Because then the objectives become unbiblical. And that's what we're fighting against in the state of Georgia, in the state house here in Florida, you are looking at some of these debates raging right now. And you know what? The pro-life movement is about 15 years behind the curve in being able to understand and speak to these issues. Recognize these folks? Yeah. <laughs> the three on the right have external enhancements. They're normal people wearing something special that does something special. But the four on the left have been messed with genetically. All of this is transhumanism. And what do we call these folks? <laughs> Three generations of Americans have been raised on transhumanist concepts. That these are our heroes that we want to emulate. Think about that and what that means for your children and grandchildren. Growing up where the science is able to replicate. I didn't, didn't it's back there in my computer case. Today's USA Today, anybody see the front cover of USA Today today? It's all about transhumanism. It's about how Hollywood is evangelizing for this. Come and see me afterwards and I'll show you the front cover of USA Today. Ripped right from the headlines of current events. It's nothing more than the lie of Genesis chapter 3. And what was it the serpent told Eve? He said, you will not die. Do you know that immortality is the objective of the transhumanist philosophy? Can you imagine Hitler or Stalin being alive today? God in his mercy has limited life to 120 years. And that is to limit evil accruing power. Because absolute power absolutely corrupts. And if they were alive today and still had their power undisturbed throughout that time period, there'd be no shaking them. This is the future apart from the gospel of Jesus Christ, reigning in the evil of the lion that the servant told Eve. You will be like God. That's where the artificial intelligence comes in, where their mind human brain interface with with machines you think this is uh, some kind of science fiction you can go to radio shack right now and if you've got 98 dollars you can put a device on your head and think certain thoughts and move the cursor around on your iphone it's four quadriplegics 
I've seen the videos of monkeys strapped to their chairs, their arms strapped to their chairs with this device on their head, playing ping pong on the computer, moving the cursor around by the thoughts that they think. Where is that going to go? I mean, it's technology. We're not ludites. We want to see the advance of science and technology. We're not going to stand in the way. But there's an underlying set of presuppositions here. And in the e unrestrained evil, we'll perpetrate that evil upon an unsuspecting people. God's people are not ill-informed or uneducated. We need to be the faithful voice out there in the community, like God, with an increased amount of knowledge, so transhumanism says. What's an ectogenic wound? It's an external wound being developed by Cornell University right now. The feminists have already said that if this comes about, then Roe v. Wade must be moot because with a uh, procedure no more invasive than an abortion, you can remove that blob of tissue out of my body so I've got a right to privacy taken care of. And the state can protect the interests of that child's life because of viability being pushed back to the very beginning. Do you know what they've determined their policy response is going to be upon the day that an external wound is announced as a full development? Kill it anyway. I have a right for my biological material not to be walking the earth. Interesting. Culture of death always biased towards death. What is uh, what are we looking at here? That is an artificial wound. That's an actual artificial wound that has grown a mouse, a headless mouse. They're doing this with goats and sheep and dogs right now. What in the world are we doing growing headless mice? Well, it's so that you can have a, a whole host of organs to give to sick mice. Is that what it's about? No. They're developing this technology for human use. Human, they call it farming. P-H-A-R-M-I-N-G. Farming. Transgenics is where you take two different species and combine them together into a chimera. And they're doing this in Atlanta. They're doing it here in Florida. The emerging technologies are involved in a lot of chimeric studies, some of which are innocent, others involve human death. And when you take a human embryo like Rachel, you add a, a gene to her, she could be born. That's called reproductive cloning. But nobody is going to admit to that, it, unless you're living in China, Korea, North Vietnam, or I mean Vietnam, some of the least regulated countries on earth. Do you know who the second most least regulated biotech company, country on the earth is? It's the United States of America. There is no regulation to speak of that we can appeal to. In UK, humans are being combined with cow eggs to form what they call cowboys. 98% human, 2% cow. And because it's not fully human, it doesn't fall under any of the regulatory aspects in the UK. They can do anything they want in the way of human experimentation. Now, we don't even have a theology for this. Does 98% human, 2% cow have a soul, have a spirit? It's beyond, uh, you know, it's just an interesting concept. This is a make-believe. This is an artist's rendition. This is not real. But this is. You're looking at a spider and a goat being combined to produce biosteel expressed through the milk. It's a new form of Kevlar armor. Ten times more uh, stronger than steel itself. Anything wrong with that? A human ear growing on the back of a hairless mouse for burn victims? Or fluorescent pigs that they perfected the technology on before they tried it on Rachel? I had bacon this morning. You know, we, 
I wasn't green, but these are the type of things that are being done in the biotech world right now. Human experimentation without informed consent. Not considered a person. Eugenics, that's another field beyond transhumanism. Includes genetic engineering, cloning, and genoism. That's a term you probably aren't even familiar with. You know, it's a philosophy which advocates for the improvement of human hereditary traits through various forms of intervention by the state. Look this up in the dictionary. The term eugenics is a state-controlled and regulated process as a policy. And this is what Nigel Cameron said would be paramount in the 21st century in the way of public policy debates is the new eugenics. A child with fetal anomalies can be aborted. The fetal pain bill in Texas that was passed had a fetal anomaly clause in it, as did the one from Georgia that the senators hijacked. By the way, four senators hijacked it in the last hours of the session, and then we had an election cycle, and three of those senators didn't come back. And the one that did is now with us 100%. He only won by 400 votes, less than 1% in his race. What about genetic engineering of children? It's being done. There was a clinic in Texas that's closed down now that was taking your money, parents' money, and designing the children around certain genetic traits. Cloning, somatic cell nuclear transfer. And this is where it gets really strange. This is being promoted by the, uh, the gay and lesbian community. They're the number one proponents of this. Why? Because they can now sexually reproduce themselves. What nature doesn't allow, man through transhuman technology, is taking the skin cell from one partner <coughs> through induced pluripotent stem cell technology, zapping it back to a embryonic stem cell stage, programming it to become a human sperm. And then they are fertilizing the partner's egg in a petri dish, transferring it into a third surrogate, a third woman, all paid for by a fourth, proving what Hillary Clinton said, it takes a village to raise a child. Wow. They are actually doing this in California. Right now, these children have not survived to birth, but they're perfecting the technology, and both male and female members can take advantage of this technology. It's being highly promoted, and you will find that uh, laws are being written. We've already engaged in these, this kind of thing in the state of Georgia as a matter of public policy. Creating a perfect race through gene selection. You know what Hitler was trying to do, the Aryan race, perfect race. Surely that's not here in America. It can't be here in America. It's in Atlanta, Georgia, and I'm sure it's here in Florida. Same thing. One of the IVF centers, the Emory Reproductive Center, actually is cryopreserving these, these embryos and they're rating them on a ranking. Only high quality embryos are selected for cryopreservation since poor quality embryos seldom survive the freezing and thawing process. Let's read that a different way. Only high quality children. You see how, that, does that make a difference? It shouldn't. And yet, they are admitting that it's seldom, they're not God, they don't know all. There are some cases where even poor quality, quality, who determines quality? Do you know there's not a standard out there in the scientific community to judge what is a quality embryo? There isn't one. H Plus Magazine, the humanist, transhumanist magazine, interviewed a transhumanist in Germany. And we're, we're coming to the end here. Is there any interest in eugenics in Germany now, or is it a totally taboo subject? 
due to the Nazi history of Germany, eugenics is actually a totally taboo topic here. Regardless of differences in definition, goals or means, it's also similar with the IVF technologies, euthanasia, and human enhancement technologies that are also viewed in this context. Do you know that Germany, among all the Western countries in the world, is the most regulated biotech in the world among Western countries? Why do you think that is? Ideas have consequences. They've lived through the consequences of their ideas as a people. They stand against the biotech revolution that America is embracing full tilt in much the same way that they did in the 1920s. I mean, when we see boarded up buses, uh, I think they're being built now, at least allegorically. 2014, children, born children, post-birth abortion being debated in states like Washington, Colorado, and California. What's the implication for us as a nation and as a culture if we don't stand firm on establishing a sanctity of life ethic in our day, in our children's day? Nigel Cameron went on to say in the 20th century, it was enough that we were pro-life. In the 21st century, we must be diligent to also be pro-human. In the image of God created he them. Male and female created he them. We have a, a display that we take to college campuses here in Florida. It's called the Pillars of Personhood display. You can see on there all of these issues that we've talked about tonight on a panel that's displayed that the young people dialogue around. And you know where we set this up in Florida the first time we did it here? In the Emerging Technologies building on campus down in, near, uh, where was it, Brenda? Four years. Yeah. This is what happens when dehumanization through denial of personhood is permitted by the culture. Should it be legal to kill a person based on their circumstances of conception? See that uh, Vanderbilt Medicine uh, front cover there? That is Samuel Aramis, a South Atlanta boy who's now 14, being operated on to correct his spina bifida in his mother's womb. In his mother's womb. What makes Samuel so special? that we would spend $100,000 on that technique to bring him health and allow him to enjoy his life as a young boy. A spoiled young boy, according to his siblings. <laughs> and we know him, and that's probably true. He's, he's, he's pretty famous in pro-life circles. Down syndrome and vitro fertilization. Rebecca Kiesling conceived in rape by a serial rapist. What difference does it make? Aren't these human lives created in the image of God? And shouldn't we as a culture and in our law protect all 100? Didn't Jesus leave the 90 and 9? And went after the one? In Georgia, we went after the one. And that made all the difference. All the difference. We ask, in, this is the two questions that have to be answered in our time. When are we human, and when does personhood attach? When should law protect our rights and privileges as humans? And of course, with science today, there's no excuse. It should go all the way back to our earliest biological beginning. Guess what happened? This is uh, on the blogs just today. India has declared personhood for the dolphins. First nation on the face of the earth to find a non-human a person. They can't do what we do over here at SeaWorld because these are now persons with rights and privileges in the, in the country of India. Would that, that extend to fetal dolphins? I don't know. You know. Would that it extended to fetal humans? That's what we're we're trying to do. 
you tell me, where are we? I mean, the goal of, of tonight was to just simply alert you to the challenges that we, your children, are facing in the sanctity of life arena. And it won't be just abortion. By our testimony, abortion, 40 years, it should have been done away with at least 20 years ago. I think we can see victory in this area, but we can't leave behind the emerging fields of challenge and, and battlefields that we're being uh, confronted with in the 21st century. And you know what it comes down to? All it takes is a few being faithful like you're doing. You're already doing this. I'm not, I'm not pre I'm preaching to the choir. Your ministries are already out there on the front lines. Being a lighthouse keeper. You know, we the storm's coming, the clouds are gathering. They always have been. Evil is evil, and it's dead set against destroying God's anointed. We, on the other hand, are just simply called to be faithful. We're not called to success. I love that Mother Teresa quote. God has not called us to success. He's called us to faithfulness. What can God do with a few faithful Christian believers operating in the power of His Word and His ways in a dark culture? Well, those wind and the waves get pretty big at times. you got to know where your anchor is. You've got to know that lighthouse is completely anchored on that rock. Because if it's not, the waves are going to sweep us away. The flood's going to come in and overwhelm. We lost a staff member just last week in the midst of the storm. Godly woman, young woman, but she just couldn't take it anymore. You ever seen this picture? I always thought that was Photoshop. Can you imagine living in that structure in the midst of the power of the waves at that level? Well, I researched it, and it's not Photoshop. This was actually taken December 9, 2007. Would you like to see the actual film of those waves? While you're looking at this, I want you to put yourself in his place. I want you to think about what's coming. And not be fearful. Your job is to shine the light of the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You've been given the power to do that. You've been given all the authority to do that. And many will be rescued as they gaze upon the light and the darkness. Many of you find yourself living in this context because of the ministry you're involved in. You know full well what the experience is. And yet we're anchored solidly upon the rock of Jesus Christ. Shining that light in the darkness so that all can see. How about it? Will you renew your call? Will you renew your commitment? To serve in these troubled times. I believe it's going to get worse. But I believe that in the midst of the darkness, the light will shine. The light.